the weather outside is frightful, though it's so nice and cold. And I'm in here, cozy, warm, with my Gatorade Zero. It was supposed to be hot cocoa, but I don't have any, and this is the closest I could come up with. But anyway, today I thought, why not do a little science and figure out how ice-type Pokémon even work? We've gone over how fairy and dragon-type Pokémon work on a mildly scientific level, minus the magic, but I'd like to start a more realistic video about how magical creatures are able to control ice powers, or be made of ice, because I hate being nice to myself. So let's start off with the traits of ice types. Let's start with the most useful effects. All of its moves in contests were considered beautiful prior to Gen 3, meaning they were all special. Then the physical special split came, and now it's all fancy with the physical and special mix. But anyways, the important part is that it's a special type, which still holds up nicely, as it only has 10 physical attacks and 12 special. And it does make sense for most of them to be special or even status moves. I mean, being frozen is one of the worst status debuffs to be. That's how important ice is. It gets its own status condition. Just like how fire gets its own. So how would a creature even be able to do this? Create ice or breathe ice? I mean, one of the most classic of moves is frost breath. The knee-jerk reaction makes me want to say it's liquid nitrogen being released from the animal to create supercooled gas. Basically, a thermodynamic reaction. The gas evaporates and is extremely cold, so it supercools the immediate area. Boom! Frost burns. Which we will get to, but... Let's continue with how they are even able to breathe ice, let alone have body temperatures well into the negatives. Liquid nitrogen is a possibility, but it adds in many more questions. I mean, where would a creature get nitrogen easily and in the quantities that it needs? How does it store such a volatile gas? How do they compress it to a point where it's liquid? These are all crazy issues, which is why I'm thinking more along the lines of CO2 or carbon dioxide. It's a classic compound that's everywhere, super easy to obtain, and it needs way less compression to become a liquid. However, it's not as cold, but still very possible to cause freezing. I mean, if a creature was trying to get nitrogen, it would need to get it from the higher atmosphere, and then, again, liquefy it, obviously with some magical means. Or, the creature could instead just generate CO2 chemically and biologically, like what most creatures do already. Look, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> And plus, if it's generated this way, then it's already under some level of pressure in the body. Plus, there are many ways to generate extra CO2 than just breathing. I mean, there's the classic chalk example, wherein a creature could eat chalk, and then the acid would decompose it into just CO2 and calcium salts, basically this whole reaction. Think of a fire extinguisher. I'm sure, I'm sure you've all seen those videos of how you can cool a soda can in mere seconds with a fire extinguisher, which is completely safe and worth the time and the effort. It works because it's blasting CO2 and or nitrogen, along with a bunch of other chemicals that help make the fire not be fire anymore, but the CO2 and nitrogen are the part that cools the area off. Now, let's look at air conditioning units. They take in air via the outside exchange or the internal exchange. This air tends to be much warmer than the target temperature, so it uses cool air passovers, basically cold gas compressed inside pipes, to pass that warm air over. Which of course means the air gets cooled, but in the process also heats up the gas. They are sort of balancing each other out. Now, as it stands, making the air get cold enough to be capable of freezing attacks is Probably not possible with this method, but come to think of it, this also just sounds like we're adding a step that doesn't need to be there. Why not just shoot out the supercooled compressed gas? It's totally plausible for a Pokémon to just be using the compressed gas. You see, when you release this gas out into the air, it immediately begins evaporating and uncompressing, creating an extremely cold environment around the gas, which sounds more like how it really would work as an ice breath attack. It's not literally breathing ice, but rather, it's freezing the air right outside of its mouth, and the ice is traveling along its breath. There is also a non-chemical way of creating ice, however, it's a bit crazier and, well, it takes a lot of factors to work. So when you compress air, it gets colder. In a layman's term. In fact, instead of trying to explain it, let's just do a little mini experiment. Yes, you, right now, blow air out of your mouth while your mouth is making a small hole. Blowing yourself. Feels cold, don't it? Now, open your mouth super wide and breathe. This air is warmer. 
And the reason this is, is because when you're breathing through the small hole your mouth is making, you're slightly compressing the air. So we could say the ice type Pokemon's lungs are strong enough to pressurize the air to cause freezing. It's <laughs> but extreme. Way more than I can do. And its lungs are also heat resistant, as compressing all of that air would generate a large amount of heat. In fact, how would any of these animals even live in the cold temperatures that they inhabit? Also, wouldn't animals in the cold need to resist cold and not produce cold? I mean, if you lived in the cold, wouldn't you want to be a master of heat? So that you could keep yourself warm and also harm the other Pokemon who are just trying to stay warm? You could cook them! Wow! Anyway, the Pokemon location design issues aside, we can get to the next topic. How do they even exist at these cold temperatures? With all this cold, these creatures must be warm-blooded. Or at least, must be a warm-blooded creature that has no need to hibernate. This is where some of the conflicting science happens, and it's all thanks to, again, good old thermodynamics. Basically, you can't just get rid of energy. To make something colder, or less energetic, you need to heat up something else, or use energy to do so. To live, you need to be warmed up so that your body is able to move and be active. Cold-blooded animals use the sun to warm themselves up. This means that they don't need to eat as often, as their cells don't need to worry about making their own heat. But warm-blooded animals need this heat to stay warm constantly, so they create the heat from their muscles and metabolic respiration. Heck, even the blood circulating in your body right now is creating heat. That's why when you get cold, you can go for a quick run or do jumping jacks. It warms you up. Getting scared does too. It gets the blood pumping. I mean, heck, even your brain can just decide to make you warm because of its power over the body. Ever just sit there thinking of stuff that makes you worried or stressed out and then you go up a million degrees? It's your brain's fault. But how could a creature survive in a freezing environment like most of the Ice-type Pokémon do? I mean, some of them are said to have external body temperatures well below freezing. I mean, Aurorus's skin is negative 240 degrees! Fahrenheit, for those of you across the drink. That's colder than the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth! Negative 89.2 Celsius, or negative 128.6 Fahrenheit. Yeah, Aurorus is as cold as Jupiter, a planet that's stupidly far from the sun. So let's just say it's cold. But how is that even possible? Well, actually, it makes a bit of sense that these Pokemon would be ice cold on their outsides. They must be extremely good at siphoning the cold out of their bodies by either breathing ice or just expelling cold air in. Aurorus' case. They are getting rid of the cold in their body by making incredible amounts of heat internally, thus keeping them alive. The ice breathing is almost a byproduct of this system. To live in really cold environments, you would need either to isolate your body from the cold outside through means like blubber or long fur, or you would need to be really good at expelling the cold that's in you to where you would be able to outperform the temperature saturation. But with the system, it would mean that your skin's gonna be super stinking cold or super stinking hot, just depending on many, many more factors. But then there are Pokemon that actually have ice on their body, like half of the Pokemon have razor sharp claws made of ice or even huge tusks made of ice. You get it. These things are pretty simple to explain, at least some of them are easy. Mamoswine's tusks are actually made of ice deposits that it gets while grazing, according to the Pokedex. Beartick's ice beard is just its breath freezing from the coldness outside, like real beards in the Arctic. And then... Sneasel. Sneasel makes things a bit tricky with its ice-cold claws. A single scratch from a Weavile's claws will get you frostbite. That's incredible! That means it's not only able to actually damage your skin with its sharp bits, but it's also so cold that it kills off the flesh near the cut. Actually, come to think of it, we haven't even talked about how ice actually hurts you. I mean, it's just cold. I mean, put a sweater on, boom, ice nullified. But in all seriousness, cold is actually incredibly dangerous. It's just that we don't normally see its effects on humans, as most of us live in regions where the air doesn't hurt your face. Did you know you can actually get burns from something too cold? It does the same damage that fire can do to your body if the object is cold enough. Even just holding dry ice or solid CO2 can cause you to get second degree burns. This is because the substance is so cold it actually damages your cells beyond self repair. So they straight up die. When you get an ice burn, the water in the cells of your skin freeze, thus forming sharp ice crystals and expanding, which obviously damages the structure of your skin cells. 
Blood vessels near the skin also begin to constrict, meaning the flow of blood to the affected areas is reduced, causing further damage. Plus, this poor circulation can cause your affected body parts to become gangrenous and rot while still attached to you. All fire is going to do is melt your skin off. Ice is going to make you slowly die of a rotting arm still attached to you. Pretty crazy stuff, which is why Pokemon use it to fight each other. Heck, some of them even use it as armor. Wait, what? Hey, wait. Oh, what? How, 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 how could an animal be able to wear ice? We just talked about how long-term exposure can cause burns. And well, it's because ice, your typical ice, is actually a really good insulator. Or at least, it's not the worst. It's not water. Liquid water. Liquid water is just terrible for it. It, like, steals your heart. It's almost as bad as cold concrete on your feet when you go into the garage to ask your dad if you could do the thing your mom said no to five seconds earlier, only to be asked if your mom okayed it. But back to Ice's thermal insulation, just imagine igloos. Our Lolan Sandshrew. Super cute. Igloos keep the warmth inside despite being made of ice. This is particularly due to their icy exterior protecting the inside from the cold winds. But it's also because ice is terrible for thermal transfer. Instead of the ice absorbing the heat from the inside, it just sits there. And heat rises, so the igloo gets filled with warm air. And it's not that just building a dome of ice will keep you warm, you have to do the sunken tunnel thing and have a raised sleeping platform. All of this stuff makes it warm, but surprisingly, the ice doesn't make it colder. It actually will make it warmer by the simple trapping of the heat. So it's quite possible that a Pokemon like Avalug is actually warmer because of their icy shells trapping the warmth on the inside. Whereas a Pokemon like Beartick would have thick fur to create a warm layer of air between its skin and the outside world. But then we have Pokemon that are actually made of ice. Literally. Uh, there isn't really any science behind this one. Similarly to dragon and fairy type things. I'm pretty sure this is ice magic. I mean, sentient snowflakes and snowy trees. Come on. Magical creatures. But unlike Dragon and Fairy's magical inspiration, there really isn't a specific school of magic for this other than ice mancy, I guess. But that's just another form of arcane magic. However, if we look to Ice's effectiveness chart, we can see that it's one of the few things actually good against Dragon. Why is that? Well, obviously the main reason is game balancing. Gen 1 Dragons were pretty good, so they had to have some weakness, and there's that whole, like, magical fire versus magical ice. Song of Ice and Fire, and Ice Dragons and Fire Dragons, and their rivals, and... It's cool. But I mean, if Ice didn't show up, Dragons would only be weak to Dragon. And you remember, there were not a lot of Dragons in Gen 1. Dragons are also masters of the elements by resisting all four base elements, the starters. But isn't Ice just hard water? Well, yes and no. Ice is much more than just water. It's the cold. It's the inflexible opposite to water's fluidity. It's smooth without flowing. Dragon is passion, and arcane ice is inflexible, cold, distant. A common ailment to reptiles everywhere. The cold is the ever-consuming fire of entropy, the eventual heat death of the universe that wise dragons are always keenly aware of. Plus, dragons heat for battle is cooled by ice's... Uh... Well, the ice is cold. Also, dragons tend to be reptiles, which are cold-blooded. I mean, have you ever put an iguana in the freezer? They don't particularly appreciate it. So, while some ice Pokémon listen to science, at least in a science fiction sort of way, others, like Glalie or Vanillite, are more just ice elementals. That's a thing in fantasy. It's ice magic. They're like animated elements of ice. I mean, Reg Ice is straight up a golem made of ice. It's a world full of magical creatures. And this is where the video gets all hand wavy. This whole video series is going to end with hand waviness because, well, it's all made up. How can I actually tell you how creatures could be made of ice? Come on. If I could do that, I'd do it. Stop the ice caps from melting. Yeah. Well, I hope you learned something or at least were entertained by me. Maybe I put a smile on your face. Yeah. We're going to continue to go over the other types in the same way, so be sure to stick around, subscribe and bell and all that mumbo jumbo, whatever the YouTubers are saying these days. And of course, never stop using your noggin. I'm so cool.